Hello everybody, thank you for being with us again here for PTT Talk. Today we have uh, Dr. Vitor Barrotti to present uh, about uh, LA uh, split stream. And uh, first I would like to make some uh, introduction about uh, the event that it's, um, our, it's part of our Peter Chronics group, which is an initiative in, that includes a Brazil-based research group and an international network of collaborators. And we have also uh, the, so we have the research group and the extension group and the PTT talk is part of this uh, series of talks about petrochronology and gel dynamics. And today we have also here uh, Professor Brenda, Ho Brenda Rocha from USP, uh, Hugo de Oliveira, that is a um, scientific initiation student and Mariana Madeira, which is a PhD student from UFMG. So Brenda will introduce now uh, the, our speaker for today. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So Vitor Barrotti is a um, UFMG alumni, bachelor and master's, and he has a PhD degree from Curtin University in Australia. He's an expert in isotope geochemistry with experience in analytical advancements in split stream laser ablation ICPMS. Uh, during his postdoc at the Isotopia facility in Monash University, Australia, he was responsible for supporting users on the measurement of trace elements and isotopes on several accessory minerals, including monazite, zircon, rutil, titanite, and apatite, and also with uh, analytical developments. He's starting in July 2021, a second postdoc at the Freie University in Berlin, uh, Germany, in the ICPMS facility. He's uh, interested in expanding the limited ge geological record by increasing the amount of information we can extract from accessory minerals via innovative data visualization and manipulation and technical developments. So uh, thank you for being with us, Vitor, and uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Maida. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, Thank for inviting you. me. <laughs> I put your presentation here. OK. I like to start. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so thanks for the introduction, and thank you for uh, the invitation to present um, this, uh, this talk here today. So what I'm going to do is basically uh, show you the basics of laser ablation split stream. Um, I'm going to have a focus on hafnium isotopes and um, in zircon, actually. And uh, at, at first, when I thought about um, making this presentation, I created an irrealistic number of slides because I wanted to give a lot of details on all the little things that are important uh, to getting good data and then creating interpretations and things like that. Um, so bear with me because I might speed through a few concepts that you might be interested in learning a bit more about. So we'll have times for questions at the end and um, you can always contact me and, uh, and ask questions and I'm happy to help. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm gonna focus then on the hafnium isotopes, which um, uh, is gonna leave a little bit of uranium lead, for instance, out and, and, uh, and other things like that. Uh, so Brenda already gave my uh, a little overview of my uh, trajectory in academia. Uh, so I'm not going to add anything to that except for the fact that um, besides um, starting a position soon at the Freie uh, Universität in Berlin, I am going to also I'm also currently writing a proposal to shoot some uh, some other accessory minerals with laser. And I actually host and produce a geoscience podcast, a Nice Chats podcast, that I invite you all to listen. Uh, you can just uh, scan this uh, QR code here in the right, and you can, uh, can hear some of our nice episodes. Okay, so the title of the talk today is You Can't Spell Petrochronics Without Split Stream. But that's not real, really true, right? So what I mean by you can't spell petrochronics without split stream is that uh, you know, 
you wouldn't be able to tell stories in petrochronology without the use of split stream, which is not true. You can do that for sure. But, you know, it's cool to have split stream as a, a tool available to you uh, that you can apply. And what I'm going to show to you in this presentation is why. Why is split stream such an interesting, um, such an interesting uh, development in the petrochronology uh, world? Um, so as we all know, uh, because we are scientists, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. And these are two perfect examples of two things that seem like they are connected somehow, but that are obviously not. Um, and the same thing happens in geology and especially in petrochronology. And our version of it is, for example, the fact that a single date without any context is useless in understanding the history of magma or the, the metamorphic evolution of a terrain. And to illustrate that, I took this uh, paper from Sylvia and the uh, other authors from 2020, and I stripped it out of its context and left just the ages. And you can't really tell any story with just that, right? But uh, once I put in some, some pressure and temperature constraints, I put in uh, the, the deformation trajectory, some other tools that she applied. Now you can see this nice story about the uh, metamorphic evolution of this terrain. And uh, that's exactly what petrochronology is, right? And in order to correlate petrology and geochronology, uh, we use several different um, techniques. So one example is that you can do some detailed petrography, you can do structural analysis, thermodynamic modeling, and others that look into several phases or look at a system as a whole and combine that with geochronology. So the, the left part here is still from Sylvia's study where she used um, the, the thermodynamic modeling. She correlated that with uh, the record of foliations, different foliations in different minerals and how they correlate and the relative timing. And then she tied all that up with some dating of garnet. Uh, so you see that garnet is present in all of the figures here. And then, but she also did the second part, which is the part that we'll focus more here today, which is that you can date minerals and still from the same minerals, um, obtain chemical and isotopical information that also uh, allow you to, um, to learn a bit more about the, the history of the, how this rock or mineral was formed and, um, and correlate that directly with the, with the ages in a petrochronological study. So like I mentioned, we're going to focus on uh, this side of, of, the, of the slide. And I give here two examples, again, of how we can um, use geochronology together with mineral chemistry and isotopic geochemistry. So in the left is still from, from the same paper from Sylvia. She actually measured trace elements in monazite, which uh, will tell you maybe about um, where were the minerals that grew together with monazite. Maybe we'll give you more information about the conditions uh, in which these, uh, these minerals formed. And then that, of course, will be correlated with the ages that you obtain from dating uh, the monazite. And then on the right, I have a classic example of um, hafnium in zircon, a study, in, uh, a study about hafnium in zircon, uh, where you, you link the hafnium isotopic composition to the age of the zircon. And this is a very recent paper uh, that came out of the Isotopia lab that I'm going to get into a little bit more detail um, in, the, in the future slides. Um, so obviously I'm going to focus on hafnium isotopes today and how we use split stream laser ablation ICPMS for that study. But before I go any further, I just would like to remind everyone what isotopes are. So an element is uh, an atom that has a fixed um, amount of electrons and protons. So what makes an element an element is a certain number of protons and electrons, which doesn't change. However, what does change is that some elements will have different number of neutrons and that, will, and that is what different isotopes are. So basically isotopes are the same element with different number of neutrons. And because they have a different number of neutrons, they have different masses. 
So here on this example, you have 35 chlorine, 37 chlorine. So they have different masses, but they are the same element. If you wanna, um, if you wanna listen to a better explanation, but also keeping this like you know, casual tone that I'm that I'm giving here today, you can um, just check this QR code and we'll take you to the episode where I interview a colleague about isotopes. And uh, the way that we use that in in uh, geosciences is that because these um, different isotopes from the same element have different masses, some process in some processes they will behave differently, and that will call what we call that will create what we call fractionation. So in this example here, uh, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18, because of the difference in mass, they are going to behave differently and be uh, enriched or depleted in processes such as evaporation, precipitation, um, melting of ice and all things like that. And you can then measure these ratios and depending on the abundance you have, you might be looking at a certain process um, versus the other, and that's basically how we use isotopes. However, in the case of hafnium, then there is an extra thing that you need to take into account besides the difference of mass, which is that it is a radiogenic isotope. Um, it's actually the product of the radiogenic decay of lutetium. So lutetium-176 over time decays to hafnium-176. And when I say that it happens over time, we actually know the rate to which a certain amount of lutetium decays to hafnium. And that is determined by the, the, the decay constant, which is a constant. So it will the lutetium will decay to hafnium at a constant rate. And that's pretty much what we use uh, to obtain ages. Uh, we know here, um, if we know how much um, hafnium and lutetium you had in the system initially, uh, you know that uh, after some time the lutetium will become hafnium. So you take the amount of hafnium you have and you can back calculate uh, how much lutetium you had originally and how much time uh, it took to, um, to form all this new hafnium. Um, so the hafnium that is orange is what you had already in your system. And um, that's what we call the initial hafnium. And then the, the hafnium that is, uh, that is green is the hafnium that was formed from the decay of lutetium. And the way that uh, we calculate ages is that um, if we're, we're pretty much interested in two things, right? Uh, we're interested either on how long it took for the lutetium to become hafnium, which will date this mineral, or this process. And the other thing we're interested in is how much of this, uh, what is the original composition from uh, your source? So we're either interested in the time or we're interested in the initial value of, the, of your source, so this initial ratio here. Uh, and what, the way that we obtain either of these is by filling in the blanks of the half mean value and the lutetium value, which is what we measure today. Right. Uh, as far as dating goes, um, the uranium lead, the uranium thorium lead has uh, an upper lag on all the other systems, including lutetium hafnium, because um, if you remember the equation that had um, the initial value and then had the time multiplied by um, by uh, one of the ratios, in the case of um, uranium thorium lead, you actually have two of these equations that are going on at the same time and you can cross check, check them. So you have two isotopes of uranium that decay to two different isotopes of lead and they do that at different rates. So uranium-238 becomes lead-206 and uranium-235 become lead-207. So you can measure both of these ratios and compare them to, to get an age. And that's what is, why it's such a valuable um, system because you can combine this and form what we call um, a concordia, right? Uh, which is basically the comparison between these two ratios uh, and the time that each of them um, dates. Now, what is interesting, even more interesting about uranium lead in zircon is the fact that zircon doesn't really have lead when it crystallizes. 
So that means that all the lead, virtually all the lead that you measure in the zircon today came from the decay of uranium. So you basically eliminate that initial part of the equation and it makes it much, much easier to calculate um, how much lead is being formed from the decay of uranium, which is why you can date much more precisely um, zircons and you can date single crystals. Um, but, uh, but the other thing that zircon um, is able to help us with is uh, lutetium hafnium studies. But um, in this case, uh, we're not really, it's not really suitable for dating. And that's because when it forms, zircon has, uh, it, it, it takes in a lot of hafnium, but doesn't really take a lot of lutetium. So if you don't have a lot of lutetium to start with, then the amount of hafnium that you're gonna produce from the decay of that lutetium is gonna be very, very small. So it's gonna be really, really hard to calculate, to measure those very small values accurately and then calculate how long it took for them to form. But it is gonna be easy to obtain information about the source because the composition of the zircon is gonna approximate the composition of the source, especially uh, uh, mainly as far as the hafnium isotopes are uh, regarded. So although the lutetium value is gonna be different, in the zircon, the hafnium 176 over 177 should be fairly uh, similar to, to what was uh, observed in the source. So basically we're looking at this end here of our, of our straight line. Um, and uh, that's the value of lutetium hafnium in, uh, in zircons. Uh, so the, 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 the value in that and why we use, we're so interested in zircon is, uh, imagine that you have a magma, right? This magma has a certain amount of hafnium and a certain amount of lutetium, which are represented here in orange and blue. And then you crystallize a zircon at this moment, and then that zircon evolves through time and forms a little bit of, of uh, radiogenic hafnium, but not that much. And you can see how the, the amount of hafnium that you have in the zircon approximates quite well the amount of hafnium that you had in the source. The problem is that the lutetium is decaying to hafnium everywhere in the solar system, right? So if you had this, this uh, magma and the magma, you know, the time spa passes and the magma is still there, still active, eventually the, the lutetium in the magma is also going to become hafnium. So that's the, you know, with the passage of time, you come here to the right side of the slide. And now you have all of this radiogenic uh, hafnium that is in your source. And then you crystallize a zircon, same, same story, you know, it, uh, today it will have a value that has a little bit of uh, radiogenic hafnium, but that still is easy for you to, um, to calculate back what was the value when the zircon crystallized, and that's gonna reflect the composition of your source. Uh, the difference here is because you had that all that time for the lutetium to become hafnium, now your initial hafnium is actually uh, taking that hafnium that was produced from the lutetium into account. So you have a much, much higher uh, amount of hafnium-176 uh, at the time that your zircon was formed. I'll get into a little bit more details when we talk about the applications, but this is just an understanding of why we're interested in this system uh, for zircons. Now stepping into the analytical steps a little bit. So we talked about measuring the composition of the lutetium hafnium of the zircon today. Uh, but to do that, we have to jump through some hoops. And these are just um, some problems that you have in acquiring this ratio. So when you measure something, you wanna make sure that whatever value you get is the correspondent of what uh, the actual uh, composition of your analyzed materials, right? Um, we do a bunch of corrections, but in half in uh, hafnium studies, our main like hurdles are these three pieces of pipe. So you have instrumental induced fractionation, matrix effect, and then I clump together mass bias and mass interference. Uh, the instrumental induced fractionation um, is pretty much what the name says. So uh, the conditions of your instrument, certain distances between parts, so certain flows of gases, things like that, 
even uh, conditions of the plasma on different days, all of that might create some sort of fractionation. And what that means is that imagine that you have a certain amount of um, half, half in 176 over half in 177 on your zircon. When you put those isotopes through your instrument, you actually might uh, ionize one easier, easily, more easily than the other one. And uh, you will end up with a value that doesn't correspond to what the value originally was. And we need to account for that. And you can see here, for example, uh, in this example on the right, how much do, uh, certain uh, elements in your uh, in your instrument setting can have, can have like heavily affects in some uh, in some isotopes. Uh, so that's something we need to account for. And then the second thing that we also need to pay attention to is matrix effect. Now, matrix effect uh, in a, in simple terms is basically the effect that other components from your analyzed material has on um, how much your in your you know your uh, isotopes of interest in the, in our case lutetium and hafnium for example how easily they ionize or how difficultly they ionize uh, so pretty much um, it's a, it's an effect from uh, the composition that you have there that forms your mineral so in the case of zircon for example you have zirconium right so does zirconium create some kind of um, uh, interact somehow with the lutetium and the hafnium and that creates you know a delay or uh, makes one of them ionize um, more easily than the other, that will create eventually some fractionation as well. And that's gonna mask the true value of, the, of that ratio that you're trying to measure, right? In the case of monazite, for example, you have uh, rare earth elements that could have a different behavior from zircon. So each mineral will have you know, their own um, differences in how this, uh, these elements and these isotopes interact. And that's why we, we talk about matrix. It's like you know the uh, the, the group of um, elements that uh, that uh, form your material of interest. And then finally, uh, mass bias and mass interference. Well, mass bias is the deviation of the measured isotope ratios from the true value because of the inherited difference in mass from each of these ratios. So basically, each of these masses will. Uh, be ionized differently before they get to the final detector and you need to account for that as well and um, this is done by um, by um, we, we get these values from studies that other people do they are very complicated studies they need a lot of um, of uh, work to obtain these values um, so in, um, in, in uh, we don't really um, look too much into it. We basically apply a correction factor um, that uh, other people that are not me have come up with. <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah, and then finally, uh, the mass interference is something that we actually have to look for very closely for hafnium in zircon. And I'm going to explain a bit better about mass interference uh, later on. So how do we get rid of these three things? Well, if we were doing ID teams, for example, where you take the zircon, you dissolve it into a solution, we could then put through chemistry and use chemical reactions to extract from that liquid only the things that we're interested in. So what that does is that, for example, you can get rid of some of the matrix effect because now you're isolating the elements that you're that you want to look into so all the other stuff that could influence um, your ionization is no longer taken into account um, and then you can also maybe get rid of some of the mass interference uh, because you know you might get rid of some of the masses that are getting in your way and uh, in order to get um, to get away to get away from induced uh, instrumental induced fractionation and other kinds of, of fractionation that uh, that can happen in your system uh, they also use spike. Uh, I'm not going to get into what spike is, but I'm happy to take questions afterwards if you're um, if you're interested in understanding. But it's pretty much like uh, a solution of a known composition that you put in, and you use that to um, to control some of these fractionations, for example. But we can't do that with laser because we're just blasting a hole in a mineral, 
and whatever was in there, it's going into the instrument, right? So we can't do this. What do we do then in the case of laser? Well, for the inst instrument to induce fractionation and matrix effects, mainly we use reference materials in a certain in a certain strategy. So this is what we do, right? A reference material is uh, something that we know the value of. So in this case, our we know the answer. Our reference material has a ratio of three, right? That's what it is. We know the composition of it. That's it. So what we do is we'll put it, we'll measure our reference material throughout our, our session, and then we'll obtain these, these values, for example, two, five, one, and three. But I know that this reference material is expected, is supposed to have the value of three. So with that in mind, I can then um, bring my measured value up to what the, the real value is and create this curve of factor of how much um, I need to move all of my values up and down in order for them to meet uh, the, the expected value. So in this case, for example, I need to add one to the two, subtract two from the five and so on. And with that, I can create this curve to which then I can calibrate um, all of my other determinations. So like now let's imagine that I have an unknown is something I'm trying to get the value of. I don't know. I don't know what the value it has. I don't know the ratio. So what I do, but I do know that according to the reference material, this was the behavior of my, of my, uh, my session, right? That's how the behavior, the instrument behaved. So no matter what kind of fractionation is happening, I know that this was the end result. So I can just correct like that. I can co use this, uh, this um, difference between the expected value and the uh, true value and apply that also to my unknown. So for example, if I measure an unknown here at this point of my session and I got a value of seven, I know that I have to correct for this amount. So I know that that's about 1.5 and I know that this seven is actually 5.5. So that is the, the actual value of that sample. I'm trying to determine the value for that I didn't know before. And that's exactly uh, what I'm showing here. This is how it looks in real life. This is um, a screenshot from um, an iolite experiment. And uh, we are fitting a spline through a bunch of measurements of a reference material. Uh, this is a spline that you calculate, so it's something that you can uh, control. Um, and you're just trying to fit in and predict what the behavior of your uh, instrument or uh, any other source of fractionation was and correct for that. So that's what a primary reference material is. But, I mean, we're putting a lot of pressure on the primary reference material, if you ask me, because what if something is wrong, right? What if I got a bad grain or if there was an inclusion or if something just went very, very strangely with the instrument and I'm just getting crazy values and none of my corrections make sense? How am I going to know that I'm doing the right thing or not by, you know, forcing the values I've measured to meet the expected value of the primary reference material? What if the primary reference material isn't doing a good job of correcting this, um, these unknowns? Then all of my data is wrong. This is what I do. I put an imposter in, all right? So, I mean, yeah, we call it a secondary reference material, but it's an imposter. So this is what I do. I'll measure something, right? Uh, this is an unknown. I don't know what it is. I'll measure it. I'll get the seven, subtract based on the primary reference material, and I'll get 5.5. But what if I tell you that I knew all along what that value was. So I actually know that this guy here is supposed to have a value of 5.5 and that's the secondary reference material. So if I know that this guy is supposed to have a 5.5 and I measure it and get a seven and then after I correct it based on the primary reference material, I get a 5.5, then boom, I just passed the test. I got exactly the value I was expecting. So I used this material that I know the, the answer to, and I sneak in there as if I didn't know the answer to in order to test how well am I doing these corrections and making sure that everything is going well. Um, and then finally, for the mass bias and the mass interference, 
uh, like I said, the mass bias, we just use an equation from literature that is usually built in to, uh, here, for example, is a data reduction scheme from iLight. So usually you, it's built in. Uh, you can personalize some of the values. So just make sure that they, you know, that you are up to date with the literature and correct them um, as needed, but it's a pretty straightforward thing. However, for the isobaric mass interference is another story. So isobaric mass interference is this. Different elements can have different isotopes, right? And what happens sometimes is that because all of these different elements have different isotopes, sometimes the different, um, different elements will have the same mass of a, of a certain uh, isotope. So in the case of hafnium-176, um, you actually have ytterbium and lutetium-176 that have the exact same mass. So they have different pr pr uh, protons and electrons, but because they have different amounts of uh, neutrons as well, they come up with the same mass. And because we use the magnets to be pretty much steer our, our beam um, based on mass, we can't differentiate between them. So we can't separate them if we're just blasting everything through. And what happens in that case is that Sometimes you will have something like this with a lot of variability on your 176, 177 hafnium. Uh, so epsilon hafnium is just another notation um, that we use to represent 176, 177. Um, so yeah, you see you have here a lot of variation, some very, very low values, some higher ratios here. And you think, oh, this is interesting. So you have two different things and they're forming this sort of mixing. But what if you discover that your hafnium 176 that you're telling that is a hafnium 176 is actually ytterbium 176. So if your variation here is coming because you couldn't differentiate 176 hafnium from 176 ytterbium, then this could be meaningless because all of this variation could just be coming from ytterbium and you're not really taking ytterbium into account when you are studying the evolution of the lutetium hafnium system, right? Because ytterbium doesn't come anywhere in that equation. So what we do is, luckily for us, both ytterbium and lutetium have other isotopes that uh, do not decay to any other uh, element uh, or that are not the daughter product of the decay of anything else. Um, and because they are, you know, um, stable, they don't really change. They shouldn't, they shouldn't really uh, change their uh, amount over time. So they should have the same proportion always. Uh, so they should maintain their natural abundance. So we compare the values that we got with the values that are expected. And with that, we can then estimate how much of that 176 cutout is half is lutetium. We can estimate how much is ytterbium and then subtract that from our total 176 mass. And we'll know how much correspond to half new. Uh, this, uh, this graph here, this diagram from Spencer does a pretty good job of explaining uh, which are um, all the different masses that you need to take into account and how uh, the calculation of, uh, of the subtraction of those masses from 176 works. Uh, so yeah, have a look at this paper, Spencer and others 2020. It's a very good guide for um, obtaining good data for half new studies in Zircon. So we did our isobaric interference correction, but then this is the catch, right? Uh, this is a, a graph from that same paper that shows just a bunch of uh, random uh, natural zircon samples from different studies over the years. And you see how much var variety it exists in the value of lutetium hafnium and ytterbium hafnium ratio, right? You have a change here of over um, four orders of magnitude. So it's very, very variable. Um, so the problem with that is, um, is, is like, it's like imagine measuring a building with a 15 centimeter ruler. I mean, if you try to measure a building with a 15 centimeter ruler, your final value is probably gonna be very, very wrong, very, very different from what the actual value is. And the same goes the other way. So if you're trying to use a 15 centimeter ruler to, um, to measure the thickness of a piece of hair, uh, I'm pretty sure your estimation is going to be way off. That's why we need to have appropriate 
um, reference materials with values of lutetium afnium and ytterbium afnium that are similar to the value of our unknowns because then we're going to have the right ruler for the right task. Um, so in that same paper from Spencer, there is uh, this great, great diagram about all the little steps you have to take in order to make sure that your data is good and also some helps on how to handle and visualize data and interpret as well. Um, but here I put a little pyramid. I turned it upside down just to, to follow the flow of uh, Spencer's um, diagram. But you can see that at the base of the pyramid is quality control and assurance. So before you start any kind of handling and interpretation, you have to ensure that your data is reliable. You need to make sure that the values that you are um, basing your interpretation in are the actual values of the material that you measured. And you need to know that for yourself so you don't you know, interpret things that don't exist, but you need also to show that to everyone that reads your work uh, because they also need to be certain that whatever um, interpretations come out of these values, they correspond to something that is actually happening in nature. So you need to have good quality assurance and good quality control. And you also need to report that very, very well. What do I do personally to make sure that the data is good? Well, this is the, the key points that I shared with the users from the Isotopia lab. So the first thing I do is I check the, the values of the stable uh, isotope ratios in the primary reference material. And that's also the first step from that uh, the diagram from Spencer. And this is why, because there are, isotope, there are um, isotopes of hafnium that shouldn't really change their ratio over time because they are both stable. So there is no daughter, there is no parent, there is no radio, uh, radioactive decay of anything. Uh, especially in a reference material. So the reference materials are usually pretty homogeneous, right? So you wouldn't expect a lot of variability in these ratios. So this is a very quick way to see if there's something wrong already with your data, because if your values are out from this, uh, from this expected range, then it's probably something's wrong, you know? Uh, maybe there's something funny going on with the, with the gas line. Maybe there's something wrong with your, with your reference material. That, you know, now it's time to go look for what the problem is. But it's at least a very, very quick way to assess whether or not there is a problem, right? Most of the time, everything's fine. We move on to the next quality control check. But this is like the bare minimum, you know, because you could get lost into quality assurance when the first step, the easy step that would show you that there is a problem would be very, very easy to do. Then comes the second part. You remember our uh, imposters, right? So what we'll do now is exactly what I, what I show you in that graph before. We're gonna compare the values that we obtain um, during our run with the values that we know uh, are the correct values for each of these secondary reference materials. Uh, the other thing we're gonna do too is we're gonna check the statistics of these, um, of these determinations. So for example, we use MSWD a lot in, um, in isotopic geochemistry and geochronology and if the the corrected values for 176, 177 half new is much higher than one. That means that there is a lot of variability in that value. Then maybe you have a bad spline. Means that you know that little uh, curve that that I drew uh, with the use of the primary reference material. Maybe I did a bad job at drawing that that curve. Go back and check the spline. That's usually the the problem when you have a bad MSWD. But it could be other things too. Maybe you have one bad analysis that for some reason. Uh, was a bit weird. Maybe you hit an area in the zircon in your uh, in your reference material that wasn't very good. But you know, check to see if all your MSWDs are good because they will tell you whether or not something is wrong or something needs to be fixed in your treatment. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, we run a bunch of different reference materials, and we also try to make sure we have reference materials of different uh, proportions of lutetium and hafnium, and that's so that we can assess the correction for these uh, isobaric interferences. So um, then comes step three. So uh, the first thing is, 
uh, make sure that your primary reference material matches the, the, the concentration of lutetium over hafnium and ytterbium over hafnium matches the one of your unknowns. The way to do that is to run a bunch of different um, a bunch of different uh, reference materials. That's why in uh, hafnium studies, people often do like five, six secondary reference materials. Um, the best strategy is to use the as a primary for that correction um, as a, a reference material that approximates the composition of your unknowns. Uh, not everyone does that, but if you at least have it as a secondary where you can show like, look, I'm not using it as a primary, but I'm getting the values that I expect, you know, that's like already a, a better step in assuring that you're doing the right thing and your data is reliable. And then comes step four, which is again, assessing that isobaric interference, which is very a very easy and um, intuitive step. Compare the value of lutetium over hafnium and ytterbium over hafnium with the 176, 177 hafnium that you're obtaining. Because um, if you have a lot of variation on the hafnium value, and that is positively and strongly correlated to ytterbium, then that means that all of this variation you're seeing is actually being created by ytterbium. However, if you don't have any correlation, then you know, you're probably fine. There is uh, perhaps uh, no influence of the ytterbium in the variation of the, of the hafnium that you are observing. And finally, like I said, it's very important to do a good job at reporting the data. So there is this excellent paper which was written after the community of laser ablation ICPMS got together and uh, determined some standards for um, geochronology, actually. But you can still use a lot of the information there and just uh, extrapolate it to happening studies. So you need to report all of the steps that we've talked about of updating, of handling the data. You need to report the conditions of your instruments. You need to make sure that someone could reproduce your experiment, right? Um, and you need to make sure to the audience as well, to the, to the readership that, um, you know, this is good quality data. So I'm going to share with them all the results from my secondary uh, materials, all of the checks I did, all of the steps I did in the correction of the data so that I show them I did a good job at doing that. And this template is available from uh, for download from this website. So, you know, no excuses there. Just just get it and uh, fill it in with your, with your own information. Now, as far as strategies go for laser ablation uh, half name studies, um, when you're trying to do, you know, dating and then something else, uh, you have three strategies pretty much. One is put two spots in different areas of the zircon, but that correspond to the same zone, let's say. So we use the texture to determine which are the, uh, which in which uh, part of the zircon we're shooting. We're confident that we are in two areas that have the same history and, um, and then we shoot separate points. The other thing that is done um, very often is that you put a spot on top of the other one. Um, so you drill a smaller spot first and then you come and blast a bigger spot afterwards. Uh, and it's like, you know, already a step forward from the first option, but you're still not exactly getting the same material, right? Because you, you although you have a, a fairly nice control on the surface in two dimensions, you need to remember that when you're drilling the hole, you're going down on that zircon to something that you don't really know. So you don't know if you're getting exactly the same material. And then comes the best option of all, which is split stream, right? Turn down for what? So in split stream, you shoot the laser, you shoot the, the zircon with your laser, and then you form this stream. Um, your material, your ablated material goes up, then it gets picked up by a gas and gets taken to the instrument. So that's the stream, the stream, and then it hits the split. The split is a very uh, a very simple kind of way to divide your your stream. It's pretty much just you know one tube goes in, two tubes come out, and you separate that material evenly between the two instruments. One instrument you do the ages, the other instrument you do the, your hafnium. You can do neodymium, you can do trace elements, um, depending on the instrument that you have. And the cool part about this is that because you know as you are ablating, all of your material is getting carried away and then split at the same time they are hitting the instruments at the same time, then you have a very, very good control 
of the you know the ages and the other things you're trying to determine at the same time so you're sure that you are looking at the same material the same volume of material at all times and this is where it comes in handy right so this is an example from a real sample where we have at first a very very um old uh, 206 to 38 age and then you hit something that is much younger and when you go to the to the half name, you look oh there is the same there is a, a similar variation where you start with a very low 176 177 and all of a sudden you hit a higher 176 177 so um, just making it a bit easier for you to see we have something here at around 1300 million years um, that corresponds to 2814 uh, value of hafnium and then something here around 500 that corresponds to a higher value of 28 to 23. So this is pretty clear what happened. You have a rim, which is a bit younger at 500. You have a, a core, which is older at 300. You put a spot in the core, you ablated the core, then all of a sudden, you know, that's a three-dimensional grain, right? So you got to the, to the rim and you started drilling the rim. And because we have this time-resolved uh, analysis, we can actually make up the difference between the two. The two. And because um, we can then link exactly the time from the hafnium with the uranium lead, we can then say this is the value of the core, this is the value of the rim. This is the big uh, advantage of split stream. Now, is it right for you? Maybe. So the problem with split stream is that, especially for hafnium, it requires a large volume of sample, right? Not as large as ID teams, for example, but larger compared to other techniques. Uh, for example, here there is a difference between the shrimp and the laser. The other thing is that the laser is much more destructive uh, because you require a lot more sample compared to the shrimp. Look at the size of that bit. Um, and the other thing that you need to take into account is, okay, so imagine that you did go for the laser. Should you do split stream? Should you not do split stream? Well, the thing is that the more things you're trying to measure from the same value, the less your precision is going to go. So you need to make a decision. What is more important to you? Is the precision of, cert of something that you're trying to measure, or is it having more information in different isotopes, right? If you're very interested in ages, you don't care that much about the half new uh, composition, don't do split stream. Um, now getting into the applications. Um, so this is what most uh, lutetium half new studies are. Uh, imagine that we started from a homogeneous um, planet, right? When the Earth was formed, we started from a homogeneous lutetium and hafnium composition. That is a chondritic value. Uh, so basically, you have a constant lutetium over hafnium uh, initial value, and then that lutetium starts to become hafnium. But because you're not really changing anything, uh, that rate is going to stay constant. So it's just going to be a line over time forever and ever and ever and ever. But that's not what happened. What happened is that you started to generate crust, right? So you start to generate crust. And what this is what happens when you generate crust. Crust actually doesn't really like to take in lutetium. The melt doesn't like to take lutetium. So what happens is that you take something that has a lot more hafnium than lutetium and you leave behind something that has a lot of lutetium. So because you don't have so much lutetium anymore, then this rate to which the lutetium was becoming hafnium slows down. And you start to have values that are much, much lower than what you would if you just kept that homogeneous system. And the same thing happens for what stays behind. So the, the depleted mantle here is gonna get enriched in lutetium. And then you know that lutetium is gonna become hafnium, but it's gonna become hafnium. It's gonna be like um, more hafnium is gonna be um, generated um, proportionally because you have more lutetium relative to what you would have uh, if you just stayed homogeneous. So you start having these uh, values of 176, 177 that are higher than what you would have if you had um, if you had this homogeneous um, source. So, like I said, you know you have the composition of the source. You crystallize your zircon, and then uh, you measure it today, and uh, you, you back calculate what the, co the initial composition of your zircon was, and from that you can have some information from what the source was. 
And uh, this graph here on the right is just another way of representing that story that I just told you. But what we do very often is this is really, really hard to, to visualize sometimes because everything is increasing, right? And that's, and that's expected because everything has lutetium and lutetium is always going to keep transforming into hafnium. So the amount of radiogenic hafnium that's represented by 176 is always going to increase. So everything is always going to go up. But this theoretical uh, homogeneous um, reservoir of lutetium and hafnium is not going to change. It's always going to have the same rate because you're thinking that it always keeps the same concentration. So what we can do is just normalize everything to that. And then this becomes very easy to read then, this classic hafnium um, graph, where you have this straight line, which is just this line of evolution here. And you compare everything to that at any point in time. So what you end up with is that all the values that are from sources that are enriched in lutetium hafnium compared to that homogeneous um, Chur value of chondrite value are going to have positive hafnium values, while material that forms from um, sources that have low lutetium over hafnium are going to form less radiogenic hafnium compared to that homogeneous um, reservoir. So they're going to have negative values. And that's what most of the studies use, including Jack's study that I that I mentioned at the beginning. So this is a very, very interesting paper that just came out recently from the Isotopia lab, where pretty much what they, they observed is, look here, the, in this area of the graph, which are the very, very old zircons, the Hadean zircons from, uh, from uh, uh, Western Australia, from the Ugarn Croton maybe, or the Pilbara, I can't remember exactly. Um, uh, they all have these values which are always negative um, below this, this uh, homogeneous line, right? Well, here in the younger zircons, they start to get some uh, more positive values around here. And what they interpret from that is that in the older zircons, um, you don't have input from um, younger um, depleted mantle sources. And they interpret that to be because you don't really have the, the uh, participation of, uh, of, of melting from depleted mantle sources into the crystallization of these very old zircons. But you do have that here on the, you know, relatively younger zircons that after maybe 3.7, something like that, 3.8, you have then these, uh, these younger zircons that have these values that are from a depleted mantle, that have a depleted mantle signature, and that can maybe be correlated to the input to the to the start of the subduction process as we know now, and the start of you know, this mixing between depleted sources and, and uh, crustal sources uh, like we observed today. Uh, I left out the uranium lead dating side of the story. Uh, this is already running way too long. So you know, we maybe leave the next, the other side of the coin for next time. But just rest assured that is a very important time, is a very important piece of the puzzle because uh, we, are we are back calculating everything from today to when it happened. So in Jack's paper here, you know, 4 billion years, even more. Um, so it's very important to have good ages, which means we also need to have all of this care we've had for the hafnium, for the uranium lead. Uh, so we definitely need to pay attention um, so, sorry, this was supposed to be a coin. Ah, okay, there you go. You need to pay attention to the other side of the coins just because two euros is, is 10 reais, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Vito, for this amazing talk, introducing so many concepts. In a, in a, so many concepts in a very nice and clear way for us. Thank you. <laughs> it was really nice. So I want to invite everybody who is um, watching uh, the talk to send Vito the questions. Uh, you can also send in Portuguese and uh, yeah, I have a few questions for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have also people 
sending uh, comments saying that it's really nice to have a presentation like this and I totally agree because then you you make it clear uh, and simple to people who use like uh, the machine and use the, the data but are not really sure what they are doing so it's really nice to to fully understand um, what you are doing why things are behaving this way and, and especially to have the quality control that you mentioned. I think yeah, that's so, <clears throat> Yeah, so my idea to create this talk, and I definitely think, you know, unfortunately it needs to be a bit longer to really understand everything. So maybe people can contact me, you know, uh, just, just uh, contact me on social media or something um, if you need help understanding more. But it's something that I've noticed a lot from mainly from you know um, graduate students that uh, came to our lab to do analysis and then they get all the data and now they're lost they have no idea <laughs> what to do with it right mm -hmm. and and even even um, experienced researchers because sometimes you know you, you don't always have uh, you know the the ability to understand every single step of data collection so it happens a lot that you just get data you trust that everything's fine and then you know start working on that and then um, in the review process or when you are gathering more more information you realize oh something is wrong so i've actually had to give a similar explanation like i've done here today to a bunch of different people over the the time that i spent in uh, in the isotopia lab uh, so it's nice to have like you know condensed into a into a presentation and and then you know as i said people can ask me more questions after yeah for sure it's it's great and it's also reminded me something i have discussed with brenda that it's uh like uh how do you reduce this data and how you can separate the domains and that makes a lot of um th this is really important for people are reducing their data or is but i think especially for those that take the data already reduced from the lab because then you don't have the control. So that's something I think it's it's something that people really should take in account to to do uh, there when they do their analysis and to reduce the data or follow what they are doing. And we we saw today you have shown why is it important. That's exactly really yeah. nice. Yeah. Because, yes. I mean, of course, uh, every lab takes the necessary precaution to make sure that um, they are putting out the most reliable data possible. But there are so many factors to control that, uh, you know, sometimes it isn't easy to really, um, you know, control all of that, especially uh, if you aren't like analyzing the data over and over again and really, you know, t looking at all the different factors. Uh, so I definitely think there's a lot of value in processing your own data. Obviously, like an, uh, an advanced user of Iolite is probably going to do a much, much better job than you. So if you, if you at least are not processing your own data, it's good to have an idea of what they are doing, right? So you can have this control of what is happening. If there is a problem in the future, you know where to look, you know what, where the answer is, you know how to deal with that. And uh, the other thing I would like to point out is that I showed a, uh, a snap pic of... Um, of Iolite, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Iolite is definitely, in my opinion, the best program there is to deal with processing data from the laser ablation uh, ICPMS. It's very, very easy to use. The, the latest version, the, the, the version four is very, very easy to use, has a lot of functionalities. You can personalize a lot of things. So we've actually created our own scripts to do some things that we wanted to get done. Uh, and the good news is that they also have um, free licenses available for students that you can request. Um, so, you know, it makes it much easier for, for people to process their own data, especially, especially students that definitely need to look into that. Yeah, that's great to know because, yeah, for sure. And also for, for some, some analysis, like for reducing um, data from Trace elements mapping, it's also really good. And it, as to my knowledge, it's one of the few um, softwares that we can use. Yeah, and they have made um, a lot of improvements in the 
in the mapping function of, of the program. Um, it has improved a lot since version three and they're, they are always updating. So I'm actually part of like the beta testing team and we're looking at very, I, I don't know if I'm able, if, you know, if I'm allowed to say what kind of updates are coming up, but there's a lot of like interesting stuff to make, to make the data treatment even uh, better and even more reliable, you know? And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great tool to, to have, uh, I, I would say. Thank you, Victor, for your talk. And like uh, Maira was saying about the um, uh, iolite, um, yes, I also do my data processing with laser ablation using iolite. I think it's great because uh, one of my major concerns when doing um, dating by laser ablation is getting mixed ages. So with the iolite, when you are doing uh, processing your own data, you have the control. If you kind of um, you put a spot in a, a ring, for example, zircon ring, and then during the ablation, and you start ablating the core, and then you have like a huge difference in the signal, and then you can make sure you can cut up the last seconds of the analysis and make sure mm -hmm. you know that uh, really. I mean, it's uh, related to core or ring analysis. So, and make sure you get a good data and not just a number, you know, a mixed uh, yeah, that yeah. doesn't have any meaning, you know? So. Exactly. And I, and with the split stream, you have an even uh, bigger control of that because now you, you know, if you have some sort of chemical variation linked to that age variation, now you can really tell if it's something that is related to core and rim or if, you know, maybe it was just a bad analysis because it does happen that the signal fluctuates a lot just because it's a bad analysis. Maybe you have a clump of lead or you hit a, you know, an inclusion or something goes wrong. Uh, it's, it's maybe a metamic zircon, you know, there are a lot of situations. So having that control from the split stream is like an added bonus. You know? Exactly. Yes. I was interested um, from your uh, more recent experience was in this uh, Isotopia lab in Monash, right? Yeah. Uh, what spot size you you are using there for a laser ablation split stream? Sure. Um, so we actually at the at the Isotopia facility we had two quadrupoles and then um, multi collector. So when you do split stream there, you can choose if you want to do quadrupole multi collector or if you want to do two quadrupoles. So if you do two quadruples, that means that you're interested in trace elements and uh, uranium lead, right? Uh, yes. Mainly. Um, and for that, we would use a spot size that would go down to maybe 25, 20 micron. Um, you know, choosing the spot size has a lot to do also with what kind of, of um, precision you're looking for. Right? Exactly. That would be my question. I mean, when you do, what's the difference between when you do a split string with race elements and with half new? And then if you compared the gain or loss in precision uh, when analyzing these isotopes, not in a split string, I mean, doing separate, se the half new analysis separately, you know, and UPB. Because it's just wondering, because when I was doing uh, UPB and trace elements, I didn't have um, split string available. So what we did to uh, avoid this uh, uh, loss in precision, I did first the UPB analysis, and then I did the trace elements afterwards, but then I analyzed it uranium lead and trace elements simultaneously just to make sure I was not getting like a mixed age from different zircon domains but mm -hmm. obviously I didn't use that second uh, uranium lead age I was just interested in the trace elements but it was just like a control to make mm -hmm. sure I was hitting you know a certain um, yeah compositional domain for example yeah, that's a that's a very interesting strategy. I think I think like you know with everything like there isn't a one way to do anything, right? So you always need to uh, come up with creative solutions. You need to do what's best for you and just try to get away with the 
to, to get out, to get away with the, the best solution uh, you can you can find within your limits. So you know, split stream is great, but not everyone has two instruments you know uh, at their disposal to just create a split stream system. Right? It's expensive maintaining all of that equipment. Um, so yeah, like what what you're doing, for example, of measuring your aim lead at the same time as um, as trace elements is actually something that I did in a publication that I am uh, preparing now that I'm actually going to present some preliminary results of um, at Goldschmidt in two weeks where I did that for monazite and I actually got some pretty good uh, ages. Uh, so I measured the trace elements together with the uranium lead and I got pretty good, uh, pretty good ages. But you know, then again, it's monazite, right? It has more uranium. And it has more thorium as well. Um, now, for the zircon work that you did, I think that's an interesting way to at least maintain some kind of control, right, on the on the uranium lead ratio. But obviously, your something has to give, right? So you are sacrificing a little bit of uh, the potential accuracy and precision that you would have in the trace element content of that uh, zircon. Uh, it seems that from from uh, work across different labs around the world, that splitting between uranium lead and trace elements and measuring them in different instruments does create more precision and accuracy than um, like measuring everything at once. But but you know that's not what you did anyway. But just saying that, imagine that you hadn't done that first dating, you know, then you definitely would have lower precision compared to. Um, the split stream. Exactly. Uh, yes. But but you know this strategy you had is very interesting, but it's not something you can do for hafnium, because you need to measure the hafnium in the multi collector, in the multi -collector and uh, exactly. which means that you are limited in the range of masses that you can monitor. So you can't, you know, you don't have enough space in your uh, in your detection system to put one mass on 176 and then another one on one on 238, for example, or one in you know 206. Uh, so it's not something that you can do for the half um, in particular. Yes. Now, as far as the the sizes that we were doing for half if whenever we were doing split stream, we were doing 35 uh, microns. Uh, that is slightly smaller than what I was doing at Curtin. Um, but I, I think personally that the Neptune allows for that because the Neptune is just a bigger instrument that gives you a lot of space to steer the beam before you hit the detector so you can get uh, very good quality data maybe with a bit less material compared to other instruments uh, but yeah i would say in the range from 50 to 35 microns for split stream and i don't think we've ever did a single stream half new analysis in the lab but i don't imagine it would be you know much smaller maybe you can get down to 20 25 if you only do half new uh but you know i i think everyone would just do split stream i don't think you would gain that much from doing single stream half new if you have um split stream available to you mm -hmm. okay thank you very much and no uh, just to complement uh every technique has of course some advantages and also the pitfalls yeah so exactly. from your experience could you uh tell us a little bit about you know sometimes you have like really bad days at the lab and uh what are the complications involved in the laser ablation split stream technique yes sure that's a great question so i did touch briefly on uh, some of the disadvantages of split stream compared to one of them and we were just in, just discussing one of them which is you will need more material right to get uh, to get precise determinations so if you compare for example with shrimp um, you are going to get your first of all you're going to destroy way more material uh, you're going to ablate more material you might get you know like we said a little bit of the rim, a little bit of the core, maybe you can't fit as well. Uh, for hafnium, for example, people use also um, um, ion probe, high sensitivity ion probe to, to measure hafnium and they get more precise values. They get a, you know, a smaller spot that you need. Um, as far as like problems that we have day-to-day -day in the lab, I mean, 
that can happen. You know, uh, there we we could have problems, for example, with power fluctuation that turns off the plasma in the instrument. You can have uh, we had uh, uh, hydro the hydrogen ran off and uh, all the all the valves shuts down, so that cut the the signal from the instrument. I think that um, we always try to minimize those by you know controlling everything as best as we can. Uh, we we have the, the the software that runs the laser and communicates between the laser and the instruments is um, you know always evolving to try to get over some of these uh, problems you run into from times to times, especially because with the laser. Um, nowadays, you pretty much just set a bunch of points and leave it running overnight. So if there is a problem in the middle of the night, maybe you the software it shuts down and you lose yeah. your sample because it will continue heating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. That's the thing. That's a, that's what I was going to touch on next. The biggest problem you can have in the laser is that the instrument turns off. The 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 you know the instruments you're measuring the stuff turns off, but the laser doesn't know that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then it just keeps firing. In and our then you have those precious uh, zircons, and then suddenly they are all yeah, gone. <laughs> exactly. So in our case, uh, we we have a few strategies that we do to try to minimize that. One thing we have, for example, is a sensor on each of the um, of the plasmas. So when the plasma shuts down, the sensor captures the that the light went out, and it turns off the laser immediately. So okay. as soon as this, as soon as the sensor sees that the that the uh, plasma has shut down, it runs it runs shut down gas. So the valve closes immediately, and you don't ablate anything anymore. Uh, the other thing too is if you have very precious samples, you know, stick around and, uh, exactly. and watch them being analyzed. You know, you can always hit the red button. Uh, yeah, I I always uh, I was always there, you know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. uh, you know taking care of a little baby. Yeah, <laughs> never exactly. uh, leave them alone for a, not even a minute. <laughs> yeah, so I would say like if you have precious samples, don't analyze them in the first block, just to make sure that everything is good in your sequence. You know, put us put a few less precious samples at in the first block. But maybe do them in the second block, you know, like do them as quickly as possible without jeopardizing quality. So, yeah, I would go for that. Um, something else that we try to do, too, is like just, you know, keep all the computers updated, um, give maintenance uh, fairly regularly. Uh, we run quality control uh, sessions uh, frequently, you know, to make sure everything is, uh, is working properly. Uh, but I mean, yeah, problems can happen can happen with anyone really. When I when I was uh, doing shrimp nights at Curting, I can't tell you how many times I had to just abandon uh, an analytical day because of something that went wrong in the shrimp. And I mean, it happens with everything. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Vito, uh, and congratulations for the very didactic presentation. We have some comments here. I put. I will put some of them for you read. Uh -huh. Fabrício commented. Precisamos de mais apresentações como essa, conceitos essenciais colocados de maneira simples, que infelizmente a maioria dos usuários barra solicitantes dos dados desconhecem. And we have another comment here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to. I would like to thank to thank um, Fabricio for his comments. I think that uh, Fabricio is one of the researchers from Brazil that I admire the most, and he's someone that always had this uh, this. Uh, you know, we worked together before, and he's always had this um, concern for good quality data, and uh, something that we share. And uh, and I actually, you know, I was telling you guys before. Uh, we started that uh, I really enjoyed the presentation from Tiago on uh, thermochronology. And I also uh, watch very frequently some of the talks from Fabricio. And I think I take a little bit of their uh, strategies of making things approachable uh, when I try to, t to talk about these complicated processes, you know. Yeah, you did a great job. So, uh, Vito, you talked in the beginning about petrochronology. 
And uh, I was wondering, can you tell us a bit more about the change that happen in the happening composition in zircon that can be produced by other minerals? Because when we talk about metamorphic rocks, I mean, you talk at a, uh, a bit more in general for the rock, yeah. but uh, since we are working sometimes with uh, heterogeneous rocks and, and the crystallization of minerals can uh, work as residual, local residuals as well. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, of course. So this is an issue that uh, is very, is very, uh, is being very actively discussed in the community right now. Because, I mean, I explained to you, you know, obviously I gave you the basics of uh, Hafnium studies in, in Zirkin. And I explained to you the most kind of like understood or, or straightforward interpretation that we take from Lutetium Hafnium data. But uh, when I was explaining, you know, the composition of a source, we immediately think, oh, is a, is, you know, is a crust magma or is a depleted mental magma. But the reality is that the, a source could be anything, right? And, and the thing is that the same process that creates that fractionation between um, the depleted mantle and the crust that is being formed and the, and the melt that is being formed um, is also happens through other processes. So for example, um, if you have a phase that is uh, being crystallized that takes all of the lutetium uh, from the system, then you don't have any more lutetium in that source that is becoming hafnium. So that's gonna change um, you know, where in that, uh, in that graph of epsilon hafnium you're sitting, for example. And on the other hand, if you have a phase that is enriched in lutetium and that is being melted, uh, then now you have addition of lutetium um, to the system. So it happens a lot, for example, in migmatites where, you know, it's, it's very, um, it, it's still being studied and people are still trying to understand how the, the melt process works in migmatites, um, especially you know with the with the distribution of of, um, of isotopes. So, for example, if you're melting garnet, then you're introducing lutetium into the system, um, and then you know if that with time um, it, it has enough time to become uh, hafnium, then that's going to change the value of initial hafnium but that's because of breakdown of another on the mural. At the same time, you can take, you can get intake from a different mineral. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, of complexities. Uh, there is also, you know, we've been talking this whole time about rings and cores of zircons, right? So it has been shown that a lot of the control of the composition of the rim of the zircon is an interplay between the composition of the matrix or of the, um, yeah, matrix in which the zircon is being recrystallized or, or, you know, reprecipitated or whatever it is, or crystallized, uh, and maybe some inherited, uh, composition from the, the core, you know, so there is, there is an interplay between that. In some cases, the hafnium composition of the rim approximates a lot what you expect the composition of the core to be at the time where the rim was formed. Sometimes it shows that there was, you know, in, uh, introduction of 176, or maybe it's depleted in, in 176. So there are a lot of factors that play in that is much more complicated of a, of a mixing, let's say, than the two, uh, the two components that I showed in the presentation today. It's really nice to, to do this interplay, I mean, especially for petrochronology. And I, I was wondering, we, we, from the literature, there is a lot of discussion for this for Garnet. Do you know any other minerals that can also uh, host a lot of hafnium or lutetium that uh, can um, help us to explain the difference in composition for, for, zircon, for, zir, for zircon. So for zircon, um, the main, for, sorry, for uh, hafnium, the main um, um, holder, holder, let's say, for hafnium is zircon. So there isn't a lot that competes with zircon for hafnium. Uh, for for lutetium is a different idea. So you have several minerals that can have a significant amount of lutetium in them, uh, garnet being one of them. But you can also have lutetium in biotite, in amphibole, uh, maybe maybe pyroxene as well. I'm not sure, but yeah, there there are different definitely uh, several different phases that can 
uh, play a significant role in the supply of, uh, of lutetium and hafnium to the system. And Bahot, because you talked about this really nice uh, technique that we can use to have uh, the data, I want to make like a, a bit a bit tricky question. So, look mm. at the chronology, evolution or revolution. What's your opinion about that? For petrochronology? Yeah, if you consider it uh, as an evolution, for instance, like that we get uh, the advance of the method, or it's more like a revolution for for science. I don't. I'm not sure if I understand. Like, what what is the difference between evolution or revolution? Like. You think that you're asking me if it's just a natural evolution of the of the thought, or if it's like changing the status quo and changing everything? Yeah, because some people argue that uh, with this we are changing uh, with pet chronology, we are changing a lot the way to interpret things. And if you think it's like natural way, or if it's more like really doing a change in, in our interpret interpretations. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Like, and, and, that, I, and that comes to your talk a, a, a lot. I was also wondering if you know some example in which you have like a conventional uh, uranium lead and half new analysis, like uh, as you shown, you have done in your work, like separated domains. And uh, and have you seen some work that uh, using uh, the split stream it changed considerable the results and. In this, in this sense that uh, I, I brought the, the question. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I have seen a lot of that. And it's always hard to understand, um, like, what's the reason behind it when you're comparing methods, for example. Um, be, one, of the, one of the biggest uh, problems with, uh, with really understanding, like, what's happening is that um, not everyone does such a good job of reporting um, the the conditions in which the data was acquired and uh, doing like such a good um, quality control, presenting all the quality control. So sometimes like you don't really understand why people are getting values that are different from other people. Uh, and we see that all the time, to be honest. Uh, but it, you know, it's not very clear what some of the differences are. I mean, if you're comparing, for example, shrimp data and laser data, um, you know, the laser is obviously uh, much less uh, precise than shrimp. Uh, my personal experience was that the, the uncertainties of the laser always kind of like, um, uh, you know, uh, englobe the whatever precision you, you got, whatever value and precision you got. Uh, from the shrimp, uh, I I definitely think that um, so it's 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 a complicated discussion because I see value on both sides, right? So I see value on going for the the max precision you can get and really uh, discerning between different uh, geochronological events or or occurrences, but there is also value in understanding you know, what processes are linked to that? Is this a real variation in, you know, in, uh, in, um, in ages or is it something different that you can maybe use half new or you can use traces to see? One, one very classic uh, example of that is like lead loss, for instance, right? So if you have lead loss happening at a system, if, you, if it's happening very close together, and there is not enough time for that uh, the, for that um, discordia line to get away from the concordia. You might interpret that as uh, you know different populations of zircons, for example, right? Um, and if you're doing a purely geochronological study, it's going to be pretty tricky for you to understand what is happening. You know, is this a bunch of zircons that are very different? Is this uh, lead loss what is happening right and it's like we haven't even we haven't found yet the perfect answer for that but sometimes um you know doing half new or doing traces can actually help you sometimes you won't but but there's a lot of studies out there that use half for example to show um 
that certain uh, distribution of ages aren't necessarily connected with crystallization of of new um, of new rocks, but are actually you know because of metamorphic processes or uh, resetting and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, hafnium has been used a lot in that uh, in that regards. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's like you know a valid point for for doing petrochronology compared to to geochronology. So like I like I said at the beginning of the presentation, you know, um, I think that uh, more and more these like purely geochronological studies are going to become less and less um, common. Yeah, it's something really interesting. And, and you have a lot of experience also with who be doing strong simulating and other techniques that can be combined to to constrain better the the process. So we we already want to invite you to come back to talk about that. Too. <laughs> it will be great. <laughs> so I thank you. Vito Barrotti, Dr. Vito, Dr. B, and I invite <laughs> everybody also to check out a nice chat. It's really nice. So I want to thank you for being with us uh, today. You are also a collaborator of Petrochronics, and it's really nice to discuss with you. And I also want to thank um, Mariano, Hugo, and Brenda for being here with us today, and to everybody that is watching. And as Vito said, if you have questions, you can write him directly and follow him on Instagram as well, right? Yeah, so if you, if you, have, any, yeah, if you have any questions, um, just uh, message me on Twitter or on Instagram. And even if you don't have questions, follow me there so you can get updates on the, on the podcast. Uh, we're ha we're uh, uh, recording an episode about petrochronology soon. So I'm sure everyone here is going to be interested in that. Uh, and my my Instagram and Twitter is at geodrb. So at g e o d r b at g e o d r b. Thank you. <laughs> so thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye.